Uh, if I can just ask people to take their seats, please, so we can get this session underway. We are now 10 minutes late, and as everybody who knows me knows, I like to be on time. So if people could please take their seats. There's plenty of seats left for those of you who are still standing about. So kia ora tato, welcome back to the second segment of the New Zealand Agricultural Climate Change Conference 2023. Ko Wayne McNee katoa. I'm Wayne McNee, I'm the Executive Director of the Centre for Climate Action Joint Venture Limited, and I'm speaking tomorrow, so um, you don't need to ask me any questions today, I'll explain all uh, tomorrow. Um, I've been asked to explain to you how to use the app to ask questions. So, uh, in the app, you select agenda, you tap the current talk, you tap live Q&A, and you can type your question and submit it. So you can do that while people are talking, and then they'll come up for me and I can ask the questions for you uh, when the speaker is finished. Or alternatively, if you wish, you can put your hand up and get a microphone and ask the questions then. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Rod Carr. Um, so, Rod is here to talk to us about New Zealand climate change targets. Uh, and Rod was appointed as chair of Heipo Arangi Climate Change Commission in December 2019. Prior to that, he spent 10 years as vice chancellor of the University of Canterbury, five years as the chief executive of Jade Software, uh, and, prior to, and during, also has served as deputy governor, acting governor, non-executive director, and chairman of the board of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. His first career was in banking and finance, the Bank of New Zealand and National Australia Bank, and since 2018 has been a director of ASB Limited, um, part of the Commonwealth Bank. He chairs ASB's Risk and Compliance Committee, so join me in welcoming Rod to speak. I too would like us to reflect on the consequences of climate action and inaction in our own country and our fellow citizens who this month, this year, and indeed in past years had been adversely impacted by known and foreseeable consequences of our collective action and inability to take action. And as has been said already this morning, it is when public policy manifests itself in the disruption of lives and lives lost and had lost livelihoods and the shock and uncertainty that comes with it that we realize public policy is not about theory. It is about how do we make our communities, our societies safe and prosperous. And it is the case that having been through the Canterbury earthquake, the lived experience of the trauma, the loss, and the long duration of recovery can be overwhelming to individuals and families. So in your efforts to contribute to the science, the knowledge, the understanding of what we are doing, what we need to do, and the action we must take, you are in the front line of what must be done. It's no longer good enough just to know you are doing good science. We all of us have an obligation to help our fellow citizens understand the challenge and the opportunity that is ours. Call it education, advocacy, or activism. We all have a part to play because we are fixed with knowledge. In my little speech today, I'd like to talk about targets, the Climate Change Commission's work plan, and then take off my hat as chair of Hei Paurangi and express a few, a few opinions that you might want to ruminate on 
during the course of the conference and talk to others about. Those opinions are mine and should not be attributed to the Climate Change Commission or its staff, says the disclaimer on the not printed matter. So let's start first with targets. And the interesting thing is that when we talk about targets at the Commission, we're talking about the domestic targets that have been set by Parliament, by 119 elected members of our citizenry, who in putting together a plan for action, said we need some targets to guide budgets and plans, and through a political process, settled on a set of simple domestic targets. You know them, but I'll repeat them, because they are so simple. There's only really two, with one of them with a part A and B. Obviously, one of them, dear to the members and attendees at this conference, is we set a longer-term target to reduce biogenic methane emissions by 24 to 47% by 2050 from our 2017 levels with an interim milestone of a 10% reduction by 2030. And that we would be net zero in all other long life gases by 2050 and thereafter. The 2050 target is not, uh, we're there, now we go back to whatever would have been nice. It's net zero by 2050 and sustained, and sustained thereafter. So those were, to some extent, informed by science, but the argument that science alone gave you a paint-by-numbers target for domestic action is both to ignore history and to try and apply an arithmetic and mathematical process to what inherently is the outcome of political economy. The targets themselves were seen at the time as feasible, although challenging. They were seen as potentially technically available, but demanding new and the take up of existing lower emitting technologies. And they were at the time seen as likely to be affordable, although there was some debate about how affordable to who. However, 119 duly elected members did put into law these domestic targets. And as a reminder, of course, the sum of our domestic actions falls short of our expected contribution under our nationally determined contribution. And currently, that estimated shortfall is around 100 million tonnes this decade. Quickly picking up on one of the questions from earlier, would it be different if the world had split gas targets? Would it make New Zealand's circumstances different or easier? It's far from clear that it would, but one thing is clear that under the Paris Agreement, no future NDC can be less ambitious than the one we already have. So even if we were to propose an NDC with split gases, the world would calculate our obligation under it using the internationally accepted process of equilibrating effort. In other words, it's not a cheap get out of jail free card. We are, quote, on the hook for a dramatic and sustained reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions, measured not the way we would like it to be, but the way the world has agreed it will be. So let's focus a little on the domestic targets and the role of the Climate Change Commission. Because our duly elected leaders were pretty certain that things would change, and maybe there would be a situation where changing targets was also appropriate, they put into the legislation triggers that, if met, would enable the Commission to provide advice, because remember, the Commission has no decision rights, 
provide advice to the government of the day on different targets. But the triggers must be met for that clause to become operable, or of course, the Act can be changed by a bare majority of elected members of our citizenry. So, the Climate Change Commission is also obliged under any circumstances by the end of 2024 to provide advice on whether international aviation and marine shipping emissions should be included in our domestic targets and therefore emissions budgets. And I presume if our advice were to be that they should be either one or other in whole or in part, how that might be accomplished and what the impacts might be. So we have drifted from the question of targets, which is largely a social political choice about burden sharing across sectors, to the future work program of the Climate Change Commission. But before we get to deliver our advice on targets at the end of 2024, we have some other things to do. We need to provide advice to the government on emissions trading scheme settings. Feels like we only just provided advice. That advice is due by the end of March, will be followed by a consultation period so that the government of the day might put in place regulations by the 31st of December this year to take effect in January next year. Remember, ETS settings are a narrow subset of all things ETS. The ETS settings go to the question of what quantity of units should the government conjure up, create, in the banking sense of credit creation, in order to be consistent with meeting our emissions budgets, which should be consistent with our domestic targets. And those quantities of units auctioned are essentially fungible with all other units on issue from past periods. So one must come to some conclusion about what you think about the inventory of units around 160 million tonnes, equivalent of two years of gross emissions, which are already held in the bank. And one could conclude that they are all held as a hedge and therefore represent no risk to current emissions profiles, or that some or none of them are held as a hedge and all of them represent a property right to pollute in the future. We'll see. In addition, we are expected to provide some advice on what we might think of as the guardrails, the price at auction below which the government would cease to issue new units, which I remind you is not a guaranteed minimum price. The market for an NZU could go to zero. The floor price is the price at which the government would not create more units to add to supply. And the trigger price for the cost containment reserve is not a price cap. It is the trigger for the creation of new units to try and suppress prices. It might or might not be sufficient, and it might or might not be effective, and the NZU price might go higher than the trigger price. In providing our last set of advice, the government took our advice on quantities, largely, and outright rejected our advice around the minimum auction price, settling for a lower than our recommended price, and recommended essentially that the trigger price for release of new created units should only increase by the consumer price index. The consequence is that we are muting the ability of the emissions trading scheme to discover the price at which it is cost effective to abate emissions. We are essentially in an area of now a largely regulated 
emissions trading scheme price. Some people might think that is good, but those of us who have an inclination to believe that markets should play a part are somewhat disinclined to think that a regulated price is the best contribution that ETS can make to emissions reduction. But markets alone cannot and will not cause the changes in our businesses and our consumer preferences and our investor allocation of resources. So the next piece of the work program that the Commission has underway is to deliver for public consultation our advice on the second emissions reduction plan to cover the period 2026 to 2030 for which emissions budgets have already been put in place. That draft for consultation is expected out in the second calendar quarter of this year. There will then be a consultation period and we expect to finalise our advice to the government of the day in the last quarter of this year. And the government has until the end of 2024 to lock in its emissions reduction plan for that period. So the work program around ETS settings, around targets, and around the emissions reduction plan is largely focused on mitigation advice. It is also the case that the Commission will begin its monitoring function, the function parliamentarians gave it to hold to account for progress against agreed plans and budgets. And if you think the Commission has used political capital in developing advice on mitigation, we need a lot of friends when we start giving monitoring progress reports against the government of the day of whatever flavour that may be. The monitoring function is a significant responsibility to create transparency so that you and others can hold governments accountable for progress, as much or as little progress as has been committed to. So, in the Twilight Minutes opinion, I remain an optimist. I believe there are significant opportunities for this country to reduce its emissions in its own self-interest, not merely to comply with treaty obligations, not merely to avoid the tainting of association with dirty products and services, but because by the middle of this century, high emitting lifestyles are going to become relatively less affordable. And more importantly, livelihoods based on high emitting activities are going to be subject to much more disruption and vulnerability than livelihoods based on low emitting business practices, products, and services. It is in our self-interests to get on the right side of history. You've heard the numbers about what the rest of the world is going to be dealing with. Relative prices are going to change. High emitting activities are going to become less desirable. Products and services with high embedded emissions in them are going to be less preferred and less desirable and lifestyles that require high emissions are going to become less affordable. In energy, New Zealand is getting on with it. Two terawatts of additional renewable capacity is already consented and being constructed to be brought online by the end of 2024. It's not fast enough, it's not big enough, but it is underway. The take-up of lower-emitting motor vehicles has exceeded expectations. The importers assured the Commission the world didn't have the vehicles that we thought. The importers convinced the Commission to delay by two years 
our early assessment of likely low emission vehicle uptake. We were right in our draft. They were wrong in their advice to us. Mobility is changing. New forms of mobility and new business models to deliver mobility services are upon us. The built environment in urban form is going to be extraordinarily challenging, but we are already seeing the reality of stranded assets. We are going to see the withdrawal of insurance cover and the consequent redirection of bank finance. We are in the future now. Financial markets won't wait for the regulators or the politicians. And finally, on agriculture, it is extraordinary to me, as somebody who has spent most of my academic career studying economics, particularly microeconomics, that we have found ourselves in a situation where the peak industry bodies have voted for a levy-like tax, a bureaucratic administered good behavior grant system in order to deal with the challenge that that sector faces. Offshore regulators, foreign consumers, and low emission alternative production of meat and milk protein will shape our industry. And we have left a sharp tool in the toolbox by not allowing price to reward low emitting farming practices and lower emitting land uses. And finally on forestry, my opinion remember, I think there is a false equivalency embedded at the heart of our emissions trading scheme. To say that one tonne of carbon dioxide emitted from the geosphere is equal to one tonne of carbon dioxide sequestered in the biosphere is bad science, bad economics, and bad public policy. But I do remain an optimist. I think we are a community and society that has not yet gone down the rabbit hole of disinformation. We are still willing to listen to experts, and we are willing to confront each other in civil society. Long may that continue. Kia ora. to sum up for Rod, but I wouldn't dare attempt it. That was a pretty thorough um, presentation. I will now ask for questions, and there are none on the app, so either you haven't worked out how to use the app, or I'm just not seeing them, but if you want to ask a question, please put your hand up, uh, and we'll give you a microphone. We've got um, a few minutes. I can see one up there. Uh, Jacob from Gisborne, my imprint. Um, my question is um, in regards to the presentation today. Um, we spoke widely about consequences. So we are in a climate change. We can recognize that. But crisis itself is not a negative thing. It comes from the Greek turning point. Uh, revolution is coming. And my question is, can we, could you spend a few minutes talking about the positive the future coming ahead in an optimistic way. And um, ideally, if we, <clears throat> sorry, ideally, if we follow all the path and the best science, um, what does the future look like? Sure. And mm -hmm. So let me paint the picture I, um, I, I painted. Um, 2050. Uh, I think we'll look back from 2050 and discover that the 2020s was a lost decade. I don't think this is a climate change election. It took Australia three years of floods, fires and droughts before the penny finally dropped here. Sadly, I don't think one set of floods alone is going to choose to change the New Zealand psyche. By the end of this decade, it will. By the end of this decade, unambiguously, um, climate change deniers and closet climate change deniers and obfuscators are going to be consigned 
to the place where special people go. So <laughs> by 2050, I do believe in New Zealand's case, we will, we will have a healthier society because getting rid of liquid fossil fuels on the roadways has a huge co-benefit for health. That at the moment, I think the Ministry of Health has estimated that while we kill 350 people outright on the roads every year and we injure another 20,000, 3,500 New Zealanders a year die, not necessarily directly and entirely from inhaling the crap that comes from fossil fuels combusted at ground level, but it is a major contributing cause. So I think getting rid of liquid fossil fuels, and we now have the technology and pathways, is going to be a huge improvement on the current combustion engine. So that would be one area where I'd say we are going to unambiguously be better off. Secondly, I do back the agricultural sector to innovate, to create, if it wants to, low emissions, high value milk and meat protein. I worry that this current setting feels awfully like 1978, where their sector at the time was facing a reluctance in the government to change our real exchange rate to realise that we had lost our relative wealth. And I fear that we are setting up the same game again, where we think it's a local contest rather than a global challenge. So that would be one thing where I think the dam will break we will develop and deploy lower emitting agricultural technologies. It has been pointed out that agricultural emissions alone, even if we had net zero tonight of all the rest, will take us past 1.5 degrees warming globally. So we're on that path. The world needs to feed itself. It doesn't need to feed itself with current farming practices and technologies. So that would be the second area. The third area is I do think we have the opportunity in New Zealand to construct a better built environment. We kind of took on the American suburban paradigm after the Second World War, and we stretched beyond the ability of public infrastructure to support. And whether that's stormwater drains and wastewater collections, whether that's public transport, um, a single story, low rise city of over a million and a half people is going to be a challenge to make affordable lifestyles in by the middle of this century. So we are going to have to create a better built environment where people can live closer together without feeling they're living in each other's living room. And I think New Zealanders do have the capacity to innovate in our built environment. So. I think by 2050, we could have better cities, we could have better agriculture, we could have better transport, and we will certainly have cleaner, more abundant, renewable energy. That feels like a better place. OK, I've still got no questions on the app. I'll allow one more. I can see a hand up over there. We can only do one. Sorry, we're already way more than behind. Thank you. Uh, Adrian Barker from uh, Methane Mitigation Ventures. Um, uh, very insightful, Rod. Um, with regards to your comments that, uh, pri well, with regards to price discovery and the ability of producers to access voluntary markets, you mentioned that, uh, that, the, that the current view seems to be in government that the Leaving a, that your your view of the government's current position is that they're leaving a sharp tool in the toolbox by not allowing price discovery. So just to be clear, is are you saying that the government's current position is one of not providing producers access to voluntary markets? Not necessarily. Um, voluntary markets do have a part to play. The challenge with voluntary markets is, by definition, they're not regulated. And what we discover in many markets which are unregulated is the development of essentially a market for lemons, where those who want to debase the currency are rewarded and consequently, the market decays over time. That's why we ended up regulating most marketplaces. That the 
Risk in the voluntary market is that offsets become obfuscation, that offsets which are neither permanent nor measurable nor enforceable, let alone additional, are given credit, allowing emissions to be higher for longer. And so one of the tasks I had during last year was to be one of a panel at the United Nations giving advice to the Secretary General on, I won't give you the whole title, I'll just call it greenwashing, um, because of the very real concern that way too many pledges of net zero are being made. And when you look behind them, you don't have to look far, that some of the pledges have no plan. Half of the pledges have no plan to deliver, which can only beg, do they even have an intention to deliver? That, that secondly, there is a really nasty prospect around the corner, which is, what will you pay me not to pollute? What will you pay me not to burn my forest down? What will you pay me not to realise my oil field? What will you pay me not to dig the coal out of the ground? That essentially the potential to pollute becomes a ransom on humanity. How else could you explain the petroleum industry spending $4.5 trillion after the Paris Agreement looking for and finding new reserves of fossil fuels that have added 60% to the known reserves of fossil fuels on the planet. If they don't expect to get paid, whether they burn it or not. So I think we have to be open to the idea that voluntary markets can play a part, but voluntary markets alone and their history suggest that you would not rely on permanent additional measurable and enforceable offsetting. Thanks. We're going to have to stop it there. So please join me in thanking Rod for his presentation.